Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an explorer, scientist, explorer in residence, National Geographic, and founder of Mission Blue. <laughs> this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community from around the world on topics of wonder and interest. Before we start, a bit of housekeeping. Um, you can ask questions by writing into the Q&A box, and later on in the program, we'll get to the Q&A session and we'll answer as many questions as possible. We'll also uh, look at some raised hands. You can use that feature uh, during the Q&A session to ask us your question. And uh, throughout the conversation, there'll be some links in the chat box to, by uh, way of reference. And I'm going to, as usual, <laughs> attempt to share our screen. Here we go. And this is a good place to remind everyone what I think about like every day. And that is what's there in the image. The world is blue. Blue, the world is blue. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive, dive in. in. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about some of the most important animals in the ocean uh, when it comes to maintaining water quality. These are champions of protecting the shoreline and um, they come in all different shapes and sizes from sort of the size of your thumbnail up to the size of a, of a man's large shoe. Yeah, well, and what are we talking about? Who are these creatures? They are the oysters. Oysters, the world <laughs> is our oyster. It is. <laughs> I remember them being super abundant in Florida when I was a kid. Uh, they were just kind of everywhere. We'd go out and managed to cut, our, cut up our knees and feed on them <laughs> accidentally. Well, this is with its top shell off. It's really, I mean, <laughs> they're bivalves and you're only seeing one half of it here, exposing that that the inner self. The bivalve. Uh, bivalve, yeah. oh yeah, right. Where's mine? <laughs> uh, Here's yours. <laughs> These aren't technically oysters, but. No, but they're relative. But they're a bivalve, relative, yeah. yeah. So, but um, yeah, they come, just and they're so common. They used to just be using them for, you know, road paving. Even the the crushed up shells. It's just unbelievable to think how abundant they once were. I, it's, you know, you just try to think how. What is it that made the first person actually try to eat an oyster? We've been doing it for a long time. There, the the mounds of shells that have been left by our predecessors. But this is how most people think about an oyster. Yeah, they don't know about <laughs> what they look like or how they live in in the ocean, oysters, like, Rockefeller, <laughs> yeah, or whatever. But as a kid, well, growing up along well, in, in New Jersey, we got fresh oysters. We don't actually go out and get some once in a while on our own. And my, the way I got to know them best was not like this, but rather as oyster stew. And I wasn't all that enchanted by <laughs> oysters bobbing around in that creamy mixture, but what I really thought was fascinating were the, were the little crabs. <laughs> they're called pea crabs because they're about the size of a, of a little pea. And they live inside the oysters. Not every oyster has its own little crab, but that's the only place that you'll find them. I mean, it's not unique to oysters. They're these commensal, symbiotic little arthropods that live inside clams, of course, many variations on the theme of oysters, even inside of sea urchins. You can sometimes find a little crab that I guess makes its way in there as a larva, and then that's its only home after that. Right. Oh, and usually it takes a pair, of course. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they set up housekeeping there. And then you know, th this little crab is a girl crab. She's got all those orange things. Those are the next generation of crabs in making. And of course, legs. they swim out when the when the oyster or clam or whatever it is opens its shell a little bit and little babies go out into the big world and find their own home. <laughs> but the oysters so, just seem like such a perfect food. They've been around for many um, centuries. As you were saying, the shell mounds are evidence of Thousands of years. Thousands of years mm. of relying on these um, shellfish. Mighty mollusks. <laughs> That's right. Even the even the city of Alameda, where DWR Marine is based, was once called Oyster Island. Um, and there were oysters there. Yeah, thousands, mm. billions of oysters. 
<laughs> um, Jack London, famous author, before he wrote Call of the Wild and other books, um, he was actually plied the waters around Alameda as an oyster poacher. A poacher. Her pirate. Oh, and oh, yeah. <laughs> oyster, oyster pirate. And um, sneaked up on those unsuspecting oysters. Yeah. But I mean, now in San Francisco Bay, the, the wild oysters are largely gone just from the things that happened starting back in the gold rush where silt and dredging really went on um, just over development of the coast, destroyed all those oyster beds. Right. And with it, the water quality has really suffered. And we've seen that happen um, in many places. So you had your book. I looked very hard to find my copy of Mark Kurlansky's The Big Oyster, which will lead into, of course, our guest for today. But I did find cod, <laughs> salt, salt. <laughs> two of Kurlansky's other great tomes. But in the oyster volume, he really talks about what we're talk going to talk about today, the history of man and mollusk, woman too, in the New York area, and the remarkable number that there were going back, oh, well, really thousands of years until Europeans arrived and with them brought their taste for oysters acquired in Europe. And then they were just like, they really struck gold because most of the oysters had already been eaten in the, along the shores of, of the various coasts in, in, in Europe. So here was a fresh place to <laughs> go after the oysters, and they really did. Yeah, all up and down the coast. They were yeah. just decimated. Chesapeake Bay as well. Right. But, and, and with that came just this the gross deterioration of the water quality. Yeah. But uh, our guest today is Murray Fisher. He's the co-founder of the Billion Oyster Project. So Murray, if you turn on your uh, camera and microphone and join us. Please. Please. <laughs> here he is. <laughs> oh, Murray. Well, Hello. So good to be here. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Yeah, we love this opportunity to talk about the Billion Oyster Project. What could you describe? Tell us all about it. This is... Sure. So the Billion Oyster Project was launched uh, on Governor's Island um, out of the New York Harbor School. And it really is an effort to try to get people in this city, which has been disconnected from the marine environment for a long time, to get them working together to restore a billion oysters to New York Harbor. And it started with school students from the New York Harbor School, but now we're trying to engage, our goal is to engage one in 10 New Yorkers. And if we think we can get one in 10 New Yorkers working actively to restore a billion oysters, then it might actually help change society and start thinking about what are the limitations and what are the possibilities of a city if it has a more sustainable relationship with its marine environment. So it's an equal part sort of education and restoration project. You know, a lot of people don't even think of New York as an island. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just there's so much to compete with. You know, there's so much to compete with. You've got Times Square, you've got finance, you've got fashion and advertising. It's really hard to say, well, what about the local environment? And so we wanted something and the way we talked about it, we wanted a flag that we could take down Broadway. Yeah. You know, how do we get people thinking about the marine environment and the, the oyster as sort of uncharismatic as you'd think it would be, has been a really effective tool for helping develop a constituency of people who are falling in love with taking care of developing affinity for the local marine environment. So, you know, when I look at this image, it's almost like St. Patrick's Day in, the, <laughs> in New York, you know. Maybe not as much green, but you know. <laughs> some of them have seaweed. Exactly, I mean, this is just an example. I think this is probably taken somewhere at where, like where you grew up, Liz, in Florida, where you had to be careful walking around in the shores because there were so many oysters, but people don't realize that New York City was once, had more oysters than anywhere else in North America. And there were 200,000 acres of oyster reefs and it would have been the dominant uh, underwater feature. And they also helped create really the entire ecology of the harbor, would have been an oyster reef dominated ecology. And so when we, when Europeans arrived and ate all the oysters and dredged to make channels and siltation covered them up, we essentially removed trillions of oysters over the period of a couple hundred years. Yeah, um, and oyster reefs that had not just sustained, you know, all those fisheries, but also humans for thousands of years previously. 
Um, and so it was, it was in reading Mark Karlansky's, as you mentioned, Sylvia, The Big Oyster, we, when we were at Harbor School and we wanted something that uh, the, the kids could work on together, Harbor School is a local marine science public high school um, that I helped create back in 2003. We moved to Governor's Island in 2010. We wanted the students to work on something together and they were all working on various aspects of the harbor. Well, what about working to restore the harbor? And it was in reading The Big Oyster, which every freshman at New York Harbor School has to read The Big Oyster. It was <laughs> in that, that it just laid out the, the ecological history that said that this was the oyster capital of the world. And this was how New Yorkers were connected to the sea. And now it's gone. And oysters have been functionally extinct in New York Harbor for 100 years. Yeah. And so uh, we decided to bring them back. And we, my partner, Pete Malinowski, who created Billion Oyster Project with me, as soon as we started saying, what about uh, restoring a billion oysters to New York Harbor, everyone said, how can I help? And so that's when we created it and launched it in September 2014. It's okay. irresistible. It is. And, you know, the oyster, it's such an incredible water filterer. Um, you know, they, they say each oyster can filter somewhere between 20 to 50 gallons a day. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so we, 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 you know, it's one thing to think of, uh, wow, that's a big ambitious project. There were several moments where feedback made us think it was actually could happen. And yeah, you can go to the next slide for this one. But um, exactly what you're saying is that an oyster, we sort of, to be conservative, say filters a gallon of water an hour. Mm -hmm. um, in New York Harbor, it turns out, we worked with Stevens Institute of Technology. New York Harbor is, if you sort of go from the Tappan Zee Bridge down to the Verrazano Bridge and over to the Whitestone Bridge and the Gothels Bridge down by Staten Island. That is actually 74 billion gallons of water. <laughs> if an oyster filters one gallon an hour, that's about 24 gallons a day. Then we realized that if we did restore a billion live oysters to New York Harbor and they were adults and they all happened to be filtering at the same time, you could restore, I mean, you could actively filter the standing volume in New York Harbor once every three days. Now we know that's not going to happen because the water is moving around and oysters yeah, yeah. are gone. But it made us realize that this level of human intervention was necessary to jumpstart this ecosystem. Yeah. And so right I, now the bottom of which was just flat mud. Mary, I can't resist pointing out that each of those oysters, like every New Yorker, is an individual. And as individuals, they can live as long as a New Yorker. They can be 80, 90, 100 years old. And of course they get bigger over time. Unlike most humans, we kind of reach a point and then kind of stay there at more or less the same height and yeah. weight and so on. But oysters just keep on gradually growing. And they talk about in Chesapeake Bay when John Smith was arrived 400 plus years ago, the, the, the oysters and he made sketches in his notebooks, they're as big as dinner plates. I mean, it really, you talk about being as big as a shoe. Yeah. But they've been doing their thing undisturbed in place as individuals and then collectively as this huge community of filtering Chesapeake Bay, just like you're talking about doing exactly. New Harbor. New York Harbor. And, and interesting, Gowanus Bay had the biggest oysters that were documented by settlers in New York, in the New York area, <clears throat> which they said were a foot long. And I think it is, I mean, and it's what's, what's amazing about that is now obviously Guanas Bay is a super fun site. Right. right. That's what we did to what was the most ecologically valuable spot. Um, but not just that, what is so fascinating about the oyster community is that they change their gender every year, depending on what their reef needs to be the most viable reef as a community. Huh. Um, I think that that's a really, they're, they're seasonal hermaphrodites. <laughs> um, I think that's just a, a fascinating thing that they can do to adapt um, to make sure that they're producing the most uh, the, the most eggs and the most sperm to have the most larvae uh, succeed in the water where they are. Yeah, and and the oysters are actually helping to remove some of those contaminants from the water as well, aren't they? Right. I mean, what we like to say is is that they they make the water clearer. Mm -hmm. You know, they, what they do is they take the contaminants and a lot, and then they, they deposit them on the bottom in little pseudo feces. And mm -hmm. so they, they don't necessarily clean the harbor in that way because they're still, but they're in these neater little packages and the water is much clearer, which is really important because it allows sunlight to penetrate. And as you know, the 
other thing that's virtually missing from New York Harbor is submerged aquatic vegetation, right. uh, pr primarily eelgrass. And that requires sunlight and it's so turbid, mostly from all of the algae, which is mostly from all of the sewage that still runs into New York Harbor every year. So how do you make people care about that sort of not so exciting issue? Well, you hope that they fall in love with the oyster, which is happening in New York, New York City right now. I, th I think there's evidence that they also do concentrate some of the bad things, the chemicals that we put in into the ocean. And it's a good reason why you should just leave them alone and not not dine on them because when you do you'll be dining on what they've been dining on which is well, okay. in, in, in a place like new york city where the waters are closed for shell fishing and that's yeah. what we yeah. remind people is that it's a the oysters have much more important work to do with the <laughs> ecosystem services that they provide and if you'll go back for one second liz the quick thing on this slide that i want to point out is this is where billion oyster project is based because it was born out of the Harbor School. And the Harbor School is the public marine science high school that, that is based on Governor's Island, 450 kids. We have three buildings in the northern end of the island. And it's just the most incredible place to be in, uh, for a high school student because you're smack dab in the middle of the harbor, you have the East River and the Hudson River, hydrodynamically, socially, ecologically, incredible place to be and also surrounded by all kinds of exciting maritime commerce. So was born there <clears throat> and then the next slide is our uh, the way that we we built this eco dock and this eco dock has generally about 800,000 oysters growing up underneath it and this is where sort of the first stop for a lot of our oysters and these are all harbor school students in an aquaculture class there's the harbor school boat beyond and this is just I mean as you all both know it's very hard to get people to fall in love with something if they can't see it and if they can't touch it they can't get in the water. Yeah. And it turns out in New York City, 600 miles of waterfront, it's virtually impossible to go touch the water. And it's really hard to go swim in it or dive in it. It, so makes, it makes me insane to see that, you know, that, that so many places, it's got these beautiful waterfronts. And the first thing they do is they put a fence up, they put a, <laughs> Don't go near a the wall. <laughs> you know, there's something that prevents you from interacting with the water. And it's just, it's infuriating that it, it's so hard to for people to, get wet. <laughs> exactly. And it's yeah. impossible then to discover as you all have and as I have the bounty and the beauty and the excitement that's under the water if you can't yeah. get into it. This eco doc it could be an entire book on New York City bureaucracy. Oh yeah. What it took to get these kids to be able to get down there and grow these oysters in the water and drive these boats. That's awesome and, and I love that you know you've got like so often on dive in, you know, have people say, well, you know, where's the the diversity in marine science? And, you know, it's right here. I mean, look at, you've got kids of all age groups and sizes ethnicities and shapes. and shapes and sizes, <laughs> and everybody's just, you know, pitching in. pitching in and helping with the oysters. It's it's mm -hmm. great. Look Hands at that. on. Hands on. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's a really important part of what we've tried to do is that by Billion Oyster Project with Harbor School and with the other Department of Education schools that we work with, 100 schools now, eight in, eight, eight in 10 of the New York City public school students are not white. And so you have 800,000 kids that could be learning about the marine environment and going into these careers, but they've got to have access. They've got to have programs. And so this, I, I agree that that's really an important and exciting component of what we're doing. And um, the next couple slides are actually some of Harbor School's programs. And then oh. beyond that, we'll talk about, um, this is our, uh, you know, going down and our Harbor School students as part of their aquaculture and marine biology program. They have to monitor the reefs they've built. This is monitoring a reef under the Williamsburg Bridge. Look like a couple of mermaids. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and they're using like tools that are applicable, you know, like she's got the calipers here, you know, measuring different things. And, you know, it's just, it's really applied Science, science, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, what a great way to learn about, you know, physics and geometry and biology and everything kind of just lashed up together. Right? Exactly. So Harbor School has seven uh, career and technical education programs where students graduate with a technical credential in one of these seven marine fields. Uh, this is marine biology is, is one of them. And they all have a role to play in the Billion Oyster Project. And so the marine biologists have to monitor the oysters. And if you go down, we'll see like the um, 
you know, these are students, maybe that's a marine biology also. They're actually the, one of the main ways, and you all know this, that we measure oysters, how many we, their growth and how many we put out is by weight and by volume. You don't really, you're not counting them all. So right. this, this is monitoring <laughs> the oyster growth that's at Governor's Island there. Um, if you go down a couple more pictures, here are scuba divers. We have the uh, only public high school in the nation that has a, uh, is a member of the Academy of Underwater a, um, you know that. AUS, AUS, yes. Yeah. I'm a um, member. And so these are scuba divers monitoring one of our oyster reefs. That's great. I love, I love getting, the, you know, the kids diving. You know, you, a kid can get certified to dive now, like age 10, right? <laughs> and snorkeling at any age. I can't right. remember how small I was when you threw a snorkel on me, but <laughs> pretty small. <laughs> snorkel was bigger than you. Yeah, the snorkel was, you could barely fit in my mouth. But it's, uh, a tough, it's a tough, it is, uh, you know, it, it, because it's cold and because it's pretty polluted and because there's a lot of current and because there's a lot of commerce and traffic and because the shorelines are just straight bulkheads down, right. just sort of flat mud that has several uh, feet of what, you know, we, we call the black mayonnaise. I know you all know about that. <laughs> Not, it's yeah. not a friendly place to fall in love with scuba diving, but Harbor School graduates every year 15 students who are scientific diver certified. That's awesome. And, and it is. I mean, we, have, we kind of have the same thing happening in San Francisco Bay where it's just it's not like the friendliest environment and it's cold and it's, and it's murky. And um, but even now, I mean, I'm getting people that, that are coming to me and saying, you know, our pools are closed and we can't swim. And I'm like, you've got the bay right there. Let's and you know, <laughs> let's find ways to get, you know, here's a wetsuit, like here's the mask. And, the big and, you, get, pool. and you get people that are, just start to, to reconnect with the water. Um, of and the live water. The, the live water. And they- It's not boring. Yeah, Never and they're, boring. they're really loving it, um, even though it's not the, you know, the best place in the world to dive. So uh, Murray, do you see the little crabs in the oysters? or there are also little mud crabs that live among the oysters. You know, an oyster reef is like, in some ways, like a coral reef. It is. You have it, a, a little fish, I mean, a whole host of other creatures set up housekeeping there. A ton, uh, a ton. I'll never forget a boat ride with um, someone who helped us popularize the idea of billion oysters a lot, Kate Orff, because she's, uh, Kate uh, sort of, um, one of her projects was helping uh, imagine the city um, with oyster reefs surrounding it to help protect it from storms through resilience. And Kate's on our board and has been a great partner and friend for over a decade. And we went and we picked up one of our oyster racks that was actually, we had almost a million oysters that we were growing in Wallabout Basin in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in a really polluted, nasty, urban, industrial place. And it's just water. But we went and picked up these racks in the summer and just so alive. Fish were jumping out, shrimp were jumping out, blue crabs, uh, mud crabs, mm -hmm. um, tons of different little copepods. And mm -hmm. I just remember Kate's face and she just lit up because she's helped with us promoting this idea of if you, if you build oyster reefs, the animals will come. But, you know, it's hard to sort of be sure about that. And when we picked up this rack, I just saw that joy in her and every kid feels the same joy because yeah, yeah. Cool. Oyster reefs are the temperate water analog to coral reefs. Yeah, exactly. Is that we just haven't eaten all, well, now coral reefs are <laughs> little too, I know. But oyster reefs, I think people forget that they're um, 80, um, one of the most endangered marine ecosystems on the planet because yeah. the same thing that happened in New York has happened in most places where we yeah. ate away the reef, we removed that entire ecosystem, we removed a source of food, but we also removed something that was slowing down storms, which is crazy. Right. Yeah, it's, a, so, it's sort of what, we, what we're taking out and what we're putting in at the same time. It's just, it's just terrible. If, if this progresses as, as it seems to be going, there, you can imagine a day when you could actually eat some of the oysters, but don't eat them all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I, I think that, you know, a lot of our partners are the oyster farmers. Um, and they're in really clean water and they're, you know, to, to grow that protein, there's no inputs. Um, you know, they're removing the phytoplankton, they're creating that same habitat. There's, you don't have to put in any fresh water or any food or any of the, um, you know, fertilizer or pesticides or herbicides. So we're really, we do promote the idea of it being one of the most sustainable sources of animal protein. 
But so, of course, once you get to know your oysters, you really don't want to eat them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're individuals, you know. I got my I, I, There's some oyster <laughs> farmers that are going to beg to differ. They get to know right. them. They'll enjoy eating them. <laughs> well, I never will. Yeah. Again, I used to, but now I know too much. You do, but oh, yeah. good for you. But. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is just one, one more of these Harbor School Career and Tech Ed pictures yes, that okay. we have a welding certification program and they're building the oyster reef infrastructure, which are these big gabions that we then use to put thousands of oysters inside them to actually build reefs. And there's dozens of these sites around the harbor and the, to get their welding certification, which is a very high need job in New York City, they learn it at Harbor School building oyster reef infrastructure. Well, even if you become a lawyer, it doesn't hurt to know how to weld. That's true. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And if you ask the, any of these Harbor School kids, plenty of them will say, I don't want to be, you know, some of them will say, I want to be a welder, but some will say, I don't want to be a welder, but it's a great way to learn. It's something no one else does. It's a skill that I'm psyched to have, but I'm still going to yeah. go to college and be a history major. Great thing to have on your resume. Yeah. <laughs> no no matter. Matter. <laughs> Um, just one more monitoring. Oh, they have a little crab there. Probably not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Crab. I think it's probably a mud crab. Yeah, look at the smile on the smiles. Yeah. <laughs> and Harbor School is not only is it, um, you know, it's it, people think maybe because a lot of the technical uh, parts of it is it more male heavy, but it's around 50 50 uh, male, female out of uh, 500 students. That's excellent. Well, there's Rosie the Welder. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> We know girls can do these things too. Yeah. Yes, and this is, I think, the final of these pictures, which is the vessel operation. So the students also have to drive all the boats to go do the oyster reef monitoring. And so, That's again, if you want a 17-year-old to feel responsibility, put their peers in the boat with them who are going to go scuba dive and go monitor oysters. Yeah. That's and the learning level yeah. just gets elevated so much. And it's almost... You know, as you all know, the marine environment is an incredible place to be able to allow people that responsibility to learn um, in a way that other classrooms, it's tough to replicate it. And then the Billion Oyster Project brings all that together. It, it, it truly does. It's that combination of the, you know, having the working, an actual working waterfront that's accessible to people and then melding these different skills and sciences together. Um, it, it really does help to so you get a lot of confidence in, in kids that, you know, they may not have, have had that kind of opportunity before. They're made to feel that, that somehow that they're, you know, that they're incompetent, um, but this just raises it right up and they, and they're given those chances to And, and they're giving shine. back. And they're giving, giving back. back. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Rather than, I'm telling a lot of high school kids in a public schools in New York City feel as though they're made to feel almost as if they're a burden to society. Yeah. Right. And so how amazing is it if you're saying, no, society needs you. You're restoring. You're yeah. leading the effort to restore a billion oysters through your boat drive and your aquaculture, your welding. It's very empowering and exciting. And also it doesn't matter your background yeah. because very few kids come to Harbor School knowing how to drive a boat or weld. No, no. <laughs> sure. Or, an oyster. or teachers either. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. We're all learning it together. And I, I love that it's a model that I can easily see it just kind of being able to be replicated Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, that's that that that's a that's a, that might be for the next dive in, or maybe for this one later. So this <laughs> was we wanted to show a couple of pictures. It's Harbor Schools where Billion Oyster Project started, but now we have programs throughout the whole city. We have a hundred sites where active. I mean, um, volunteers are running what are called oyster research stations, where they have a little, a little oyster garden down around the shoreline somewhere. And we have a huge volunteer program where people come out and help us build the reefs and monitor the reefs. So it's gone way beyond Harbor School now, even though that's where it started. Yeah, that's such a great activity is going out to the beach with a little dip net and just checking things out. <laughs> it's just, oh, yeah. you know. And, and there's so much more associated around the oyster reefs than just in the sandy areas. Yeah, you just can, can just scoop up all kinds of little critters out there. Cross section of life. Yeah. And there they are. Look at all those guys. There's some more of it. Exactly. You know, the, it's, those are the oyster drills on the bottom left, which I don't know if people know this, and I'm going to, it's embarrassing trying to describe this stuff in, in, in front of you all, but <laughs> the <laughs> oyster drill is a snail, is a marine snail that actually can create a hole in the oyster shell, and then it ingests the, it ingests the oyster. And so that's the biggest predator of our oyster reefs right there, that tiny little, sweet little marine snail. Yeah, and it, yeah, it can do a lot of a lot of harm to the oysters. 
Right. So it's but we're excited to know more predators. That's just all part of the ecosystem. So yeah. our answer is the, 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 the way to address that is to actually, instead of putting in a, a, a 500 square foot reef, it's a five acre reef or a 50 right. acre reef. Right. So you have, there's enough, there's balance. There's enough for there's balance. Everybody. And there's yeah. safe predator satiation as part of yeah. it too. Yeah. And that's, um, are you seeing that, that uh, microplastics are an issue with any of the oysters in the program or? You know, that is, I, I actually don't, ha I don't know. I know that people are talking about it and I'm sure that if Pete were on here, he would have an answer to it. Um, and I don't know if we've been getting our oysters tested, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be surprised um, if they had some microplastics, but it hasn't affected us because they're doing their work down there under the water, creating, right. and the, creating the resiliency in the habitat. So I don't, and the filtration. So I don't know um, the answer to that. I've, I've had people ask me, you know, can an oyster turn microplastic into a pearl? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> oh that would be amazing. That would be as if oysters aren't already being asked to do enough. Protect know, our right? it's like, Come on, let's make some our water. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you oysters. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Go, Mollus, go. <laughs> this is going down at the seashore, a school group uh, putting in a, a reef, and it's actually... Um, you know, just shows that every different kind of person can get engaged in the program. Um, and then I think the next one is our restaurant one, which I want to, oh, here's just more volunteers building the oyster cages. We have about 10 different kinds of oyster reef infrastructure that we build and we need volunteers to come help us do that on Governor's Island. I think that's really important too, because, you know, it's not like a one size fits all uh, situation, you know, because you've got different regions in the harbor, different areas that you need a different Again, as you're saying, a high current area. Um, you've got er some areas that have more silt than others, so you do have to have other, you know, certain different structures mm -hmm. where you can and different skills for addressing that. Yeah, and and you have this, you have a foundation, right? No, uh, so we Billion Oyster Project is the nonprofit. Yeah, right. So that yeah. and to support this, you're able to. We raise about half the money. Um, is um, well, we we have to raise about a third of the money annually through just contributions and then another third is about foundations that we can count on and another third is government grants and contracts mm -hmm. so yeah. the limiting yeah. factors you all probably know in restoring oysters to the harbor is first of all is the water quality good enough so that the oyster can go through metamorphosis because the oyster larvae there may be enough uh, uh, oysters in the harbor that they reproduce and the oyster larvae swim around in the harbor. But most of the time when they, if they find something hard to attach to, which they mostly don't, they mostly die in the mud. But if they do, most of them then die going through metamorphosis and going from being free swimming larvae to being a sessile organism that will live in that one spot for the rest of its life because they become more vulnerable during metamorphosis and the water quality has to be really good during that period. Mm -hmm. And so lack of adult oysters is one reason that they haven't re you know, haven't come back in New York Harbor. Lack of the water quality being good enough to go through that metamorphosis is the second reason. The third is that there's no substrate on the bottom. And so that's one that we're, so we are trying to collect oyster shells. We have 75 partner restaurants that they volunteer to store their oyster shells. We pick them up 8,000 pounds a week in a little truck. Talisker is our sponsor for this program, which we're really grateful to that. That's cool. And we, in the lab in the hatchery at Governor's Island, we actually attach um, the free swimming larvae directly to the shell. And then after they've grown a little bit, maybe about these little clusters of what's called spat on shell, then we move them down into the reef and they're much more likely to survive. Right. Um, in the harbor after they're a little bit older. And so <laughs> it's just an example of we are trying to get everybody engaged in helping us uh, restore oysters. And that's only from 75 restaurants. There's 750 restaurants that serve oysters. Right. So we could collect, if we had the money, we collect a lot more and we, and we cure them on a gigantic site, on Governor, one on Governor's Island and one on Staten Island where they have to sit for a year in the sun to make sure they're biologically inert, that they're dead. Right, because right, you don't want to accidentally, you know, introduce any sort of pathogens or yeah. uh, invasive species or anything like that. Exactly. And that's so they, is really has been a great partner in helping us through all, all that permitting and all of that assurances. Yeah. We have a local group here that's trying to work with the Olympic oyster there. 
they cure theirs by uh, turning them out first to a group of chickens. <laughs> and the chickens, you know, go through and they, they pick out any little bits and pieces of leftover uh, oyster debris. Plus it gives them calcium for their yeah. egg production. And then and they- uh, it up. Yeah. And, and then they, uh, it's, yeah, they kind of like, you know, peck around on the surfaces a little bit and then they, you know, create kind of an oyster midden and then cure for every year, like you say, till they're um, kind of acceptable and clean. That's the wild oyster project. Yeah, that's locally. In here. San Francisco, but they, it's a different kind of oyster. This is a little Olympic oyster. Yeah, the little thumb size guys. Yeah. Right. Right. Species, but similar thing. Well, that's, we have uh, a partner on Governor's Island called Earth Matter and they have a lot of chickens. Yeah, so we, might, we might we might steal that good idea. Yeah, that would be great. It sounds like a win-win. Yeah, the chickens really they're they're all they're all in. You know, they, <laughs> they are sure, and they help move the shells around probably too. What you want? Oh yeah, they do. They flip them over and and do their thing there. So it's it's kind of a, a good good way to do it. Um, nice. And then and where did so you said you, so you've got a hatchery for the adult oysters and we have a hatchery at Harbor School. And so the aquaculture students um, do all of the growing of the oysters um, with their aquaculture teacher and a hatchery technician. That's so, cool. Yeah, they grow them um, and they, they rear them there, they spawn them there, and then the larvae are put in separate remote setting tanks um, and, and allow the little baby oysters to attach to the shells all of the harbor school. Oh, uh -huh. look, look at this. this. <laughs> it's a nice community group down by the water's edge. But, you, you know, this is what most of the waterfront in New York Harbor looks like. And this is our boat that we pull up to the bulkhead there. We've certainly been pushing pushing the envelope a lot on what's um, how to access the bulkhead with community groups and ourselves with different boats. And it's just great to push it so that the city has to start thinking about maybe yeah. rather than being afraid of this resource, maybe let's make it. You know, we would like to think of New York Harbor as being a gigantic park for the city and particularly the youth in New York City who are not, may not necessarily be able to go out to the Hamptons on the weekend or go on, right? Like, yeah. there's our place to run and play and recreate and swim and sail and canoe and yeah. grow our minds and our bodies in the way that everyone knows is good for you. We want New York Harbor to be that for the kids in New York City. It absolutely should be. I mean, there's so many things you can do on the water, you know, as you're saying, all the paddling sports, the direct swimming and, and scuba diving, snorkeling. It's just making the connection that we're a part of nature. Yeah. Right. right. You start and asking questions. Where does air come from? Where does, where does the water come from? Where does it go? <laughs> but Who you, lives there? But you see, you know, you see things like this bulkhead and, and you just kind of want to find an architect and shake them and like, what are you thinking? <laughs> a civil oh, no. engineer is like, guys, come on. You know? <laughs> right. Well, the landowner, the landowner yeah. wants as much land Sure. The state won't let you fill any in. And yeah. So you can't have that slope because the state won't let you fill in any of the bottom. And so what ends up with the landowner push, they, they don't want to give any up and, and, and let there be a slope. So you very rarely find uh, places where they end up designing a sloping uh, bank mm -hmm. that would be much better ecologically and for access. Yeah. This is, all the old shipways are really long gone. So. Right. It's and tough. marshes and marshes yeah so we have restored 47 million oysters so far which is uh not uh you know a long way to go to a billion <laughs> uh that's in about five it's in six years um but we this year we have came up with some new techniques because of covid we had to rethink our programs and we came up with some new techniques of how we can scale up our oyster restoration even more with limited resources and limited outside help um, and so we're learning, um, and, and, and this year was our biggest year yet. And so we're trying to get to 50 million oysters a year is our goal on restoration. Great. That's wonderful. Well, in due course, Murray, I think that vision of you get enough oysters and the water quality for a variety of avenues. It's not just, you don't leave it all to the oysters, but there are other measures that the city, the whole country can apply to get water quality better. Mm -hmm. the oysters will do it themselves you know that the time will come exactly well we're starting to see that so good. that's what's really exciting is we're starting to see baby oysters on lots of hard infrastructure in a bunch of different places where we had not seen them for 20 years I mean, awesome. of all of our time monitoring them so we're not taking credit for we're only going to count the oysters that we put into the water 
So we're going to get to a billion through ones that we plant. We're not going to count all the new oysters. That's just going to be. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the other big dividend is what this is going to do um, for New York in terms of storm protection yeah. as well. Oh, um, you know, sure. if we're getting, you know, larger, heavier storms coming through. The oysters were always like one of those first lines of defense for yeah. uh, coastal erosion marshes and too. marshes mm. and the eelgrass beds and so forth. So it's, I think it's, you know, doubly important. Not, it's not just the water quality and the fact that we want, if we want to be able to eat oysters, we have to protect the water and, and make it cleaner. Yeah. Um, but it's also going to help us with, uh, you know, in times of climate disruption uh, to reinforce the, the harbor edge and the shoreline. Exactly. And that's our biggest sort of experiment on that is with Kate Orb's organization and uh, um, the federal government with HUD, which after Hurricane Sandy, they had a massive global competition for ideas about how to rebuild the Sandy affected region. Um, and, and, and we were part of Kate's team in creating and designing something called Living Breakwaters, which will be a several mile long breakwater off the coast of Staten Island that will essentially be a built big oyster reef. Um, and it's gonna, it's different than the ones that, a lot of the ones we've done, it'll actually have a lot of concrete and a lot of actual hard structures, um, but it'll be a great way for us to start learning how that start uh, can impact and reduce further storm damage. But that's built precisely with that Hurricane Sandy funds for that purpose. And it's been, you know, that gave us a lot of, reason to push forward with more ambitious reef plans um, and with more support from the entire fe federal and state and city government. Working with nature. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Giving back. High mm -hmm. time. I'd love to see this as well, you know, again, talking about how, how in, I know it'll be another episode, but talking about how and where we can um, see the same sort of program being replicated and thinking about the Gulf of Mexico and and how much was damaged after the Deepwater Horizon spill and then these you know successive Storms, hurricanes coming yeah. through um, that there's just and how much uh, shoreline is being lost there that by jump starting oysters in these other areas that have seen real adversity over mm -hmm. a number of years or even decades that you know we can kind of again help turn the tide and mm -hmm. and restore well, it's it and it, it's happening uh, the Heart Research Institute and Corpus Christi. They're working with the local organizations and and really gearing up to give back. And we, Apalachicola, <laughs> the, the oysters yeah. there were once famous and, and they, just like New York, they kind of stripped them out. Right. They didn't eat all of them, but they certainly took a big bite out of the ocean with what was taken. And it's learning how to work with nature yeah. for all the reasons that benefit mm -hmm. Us and, yeah. the, and you mentioned the Chesapeake Bay as well, but there's just yeah. so many of these areas. But seeing the success in a place like New York, which some people might just think, you know, it's a lost cause. <laughs> you know, yeah. So much stuff is being dumped into the into the harbor, um, and it's such a heavily used body of water. But engaging the kids is another. It's key. Critical it's absolutely, part. It's of absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. That's why we talk about the, 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 you know, if we were a group of environmentalists who went and tried to restore a billion oysters in New York City, first of all, it would, it would be probably a cheaper and faster route um, <laughs> because it's hard to engage a lot of people, particularly uh, a lot of youth. But we want to change society as much as we want to restore the harbor. We want New York laws and, 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 and policies and planning to reflect the benefits and the constraints of this amazing marine ecosystem. And so if, if we can engage everyone in helping us restore the billion oysters, then we think that the city will change. But if we just have a small group of people, and this has been a real weakness of environmentalism in the US, I think is it's been sort of on the periphery often. And so how do you get restoring oysters into the mainstream of New York public schools? Yeah, right? that's why that's one of the reasons why it's been an effective way to sort of awaken New Yorkers to this incredible resource and opportunity there is with a restored New York Harbor. Well, you're restoring that, but you're restoring the connection with nature. Right, exactly. Which is exactly. That's the goal. One of the big problems with our society today, we we become too 
separated from the very systems that keep us alive. Yeah, exactly. and that's exactly what we're trying to do in New York City. And it's, it's, it's been incredible to see that even in a place so removed, it's possible and people are yearning for it. Yeah, and it, it's, it's really uh, very similar to what you're doing with the Hope Spots, the Mission Blue Hope Spots, is that each Hope Spot has to have sort of a constituency. A constituency, of, you know, there's sort of a, always kind of a, a local champion and a, you know, science element but it's really about getting the community behind it. And right. because you don't want to come in as just sort of like this outside person saying, you know, I'm here to restore tell this or save do. that or tell you what to do. Yeah. But it's really all about that community engagement and, mm -hmm. and understanding that by reconnecting, it, it makes everything more sustainable, better for our health, better across the board. Right. Well, you do not know it, but this is a hope spot that you've got going here. <laughs> it is, it really Mary. is. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And this is our staff as I, I'm the board chair now. So I've been, um, uh, uh, let's see, three years now removed from the day to day. So it makes me proud to look at this staff, but also sad that I'm not there with them every day. We've grown when we launched by an Oyster Project September 2014. We were uh, two people and now we're 30 people. Um, and our budget's nearly $5 million. Um, and Pete Malinowski is up there on the top right as the executive uh, director. And this is the rest of the incredible Billion Oyster Project staff that makes it happen every day. And there's several, what's really cool is there's several Harbor School graduates awesome. um, who want to study something like marine yeah. science or something related who we've now hired to work at Billion Oyster Project. That's just the best. You grow your own staff. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Am I, am I correct that I've found myself in, a, in the dark? Is that true? You are a little bit dark. There you go. Hey. So go into the sun. <laughs> or into the light. Yeah. Go into the light. Okay. <laughs> there you go. That's better. Um, so I just wanted to share. I want to show you this one little slide here. That This is just a, a local effort here in San Francisco. They, they've got a, a wetland and they've put out these, these reef balls in hopes of uh, attracting some oysters, but also making some additional habitat. Um, waiting for, for the oysters to, to, do, to yeah. see what else yeah. will come. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll have to give you some updates on this and see what happens down the road. <laughs> I can't wait to see. That's the before. I want to see the three years later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. But so that's kind of the end of our slides. And I think we're going to go over and get ready to take some questions. And let's see here. Hmm. If you do want to raise your hand, you can do that with the raise your hand feature. And Gigi will call on you. She'll let me know if I have raised hands. And then um, if you do ask a live question, please keep the question very concise so that we have a chance to get through um, and go get to everybody. So let's dive in here. Okay. Uh, James is asking us, why don't the oysters digest the crabs or the crab eggs? <laughs> we have some idea about hmm. that. Well, over a gazillion years, they've kind of figured out this partnership that the crabs, first of all, are kind of biggish. I mean, when they're small, you're right. They might just get gobbled up as a bit Filtered. of plankton. <laughs> but there must be something in the nature of the baby crabs when they set up housekeeping. Um, probably a chemical signal of some sort saying, I'm not good to eat. I don't really know, but the the way that creatures have figured out how to collaborate, cooperate over the years with these symbiotic relationships, they're almost everywhere. We just haven't had the the ability to seek them out. But the, the more we look, the more we find about these interrelationships. You, you might ask, well, what good or is there any benefit to the oyster of having a crab living inside? Well, maybe that's part of the cleanup crew. Maybe the crab will get these big chunks of whatever it is that the oyster takes in and throw them out or eat them up or whatever it is. Or maybe they produce some, through their digestive system, some beneficial products that are good for the oyster. Maybe they get out there and go after those little drill shells. <laughs> they could, they might. You know, maybe. It might be amazing, send them out to stop the oyster drills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, nature is surprises every day that you learn more. Nature is more surprising, whichever species, particularly no, the commensalism and interspecies relationship. That'd be nice yeah. to know. It's just that kind of question that you, you've asked, James, that leads to finding answers. If you don't ask questions, you'll never find the answers. That's right. But it's, yeah. uh, 
It's a, it's a good one. There, somebody might have the answer already. Yeah, we just have to do some more research. Maybe your kids out. can get on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, they probably know it. I'm, they're sitting here saying we know the answer probably. Yeah, exactly. Well, having some setups at the school where you watch the behavior of oysters and these little crabs, not just the symbiotic ones, but the ones that form the community, mm -hmm. mud crabs. I used to find those mud crabs just so entrancing. And the drills themselves. Right. There is this community, and they they figured it out over a very long time. We're just for the first time able to to ask these questions and maybe come up with answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Emily is asking us, how does each oyster in the colony decide whether or not to change sex? Ah, uh, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> if one oyster thinks it should switch to a male, how does it know all of its neighbors won't do exactly the same thing? Maybe they should. You know, it's it's in the chemistry. I. I don't have an answer to that either, but it's it's these somehow I, I I know enough to to posit sort of I think that there's some chemical communication right. between that reef of oysters and the oysters nearby with which they will probably be sharing sperm and eggs that they need I, the, the 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 females are much more valuable and they're bigger and those gametes are uh, are more energy intensive to produce. And so I think that they need more females. And so if it's, if, you know, if you were a, a, a male last year, maybe it's your turn to turn into a female. <laughs> but there's some ratio, I think it's um, three to one, three females to one male, because the eggs are that much more valuable and important. And the males can produce more sperm at less cost. And right. so I, think that, um, I don't, I have no idea, but there must be some chemical communication that, yeah determines which ones switch, which is fascinating because it really makes them almost, um, they're almost acting like a individual as opposed to a community. The right. community is the individual in a right. sense. The, the, all the pieces make the whole. Right. The, the chemical communication in the ocean, we have a sense of smell, which is kind of related, but in order to understand what a, what a fish senses or what an oyster senses, it's really hard because we're not in their environment and we're not equipped with their senses. But at least we have the capacity to do what we, we can figure them out eventually, perhaps. I don't think they're thinking about figuring out us. No. <laughs> can, I, can I just go on that? I think one of the most fascinating things that I also don't understand either is that the most likely place for oyster larvae to land is on a live oyster. That's well, right. <laughs> if you put all, if you put oyster, in, and, and it's because biologically they are getting some cues that that's the best place to be because it means that there are living oysters here. Yeah. The second yeah. best place is an oyster shell because that indicates that there were oysters here. Oh, they will yeah. land on rocks, they will land on mussels, and they can grow there. But their favorite place, the best place, is on a live oyster. And so they're getting some cues. Yeah. yeah. These little swimming oyster larvae that are not strong enough to swim against the current, they're, they're plankton. Yeah. They can just move up and down and they settle on a live oyster shell. That's their preferred substrate. And then they, I think that's just fascinating also. How in the world are they finding that living oyster? Yeah, it's just incredible. And, they, and as you say, it's probably really the most beneficial place for them to be because if, the, if they're thriving live oysters, it means that there's probably reliable food, yeah. the water quality is better, so mm -hmm. they have a better chance of getting through metamorphosis why, and and why do persisting. people move into the city yeah <laughs> and over and over hundreds of years then that you know they all build up on top of one another yeah and it really does make a very fortified shoreline yeah exactly. very brilliant so it's and get them out and out, out of the mud where there's right. more plankton and, and you know cleaner water right so with abalone if there there is something that in, in it's in the chemistry of these different kind of mollusks, but still um, the larvae of the abalone will keep on swimming unless there's something, that the chemistry is right, that will trigger them to stop swimming and, and sink to the bottom. Yeah, And it's typically because there are other abalone that give off the essence of abalone, saying, <laughs> you're welcome here, please come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's incredible. I love that. You're going to bottle it. Abalone, yeah, yeah, you know? a little behind each other. You know? <laughs> Oyster. Yeah. 
Okay, so Elizabeth is asking us, so given the filtering issues, are there certain areas where you would really advise uh, oysters are safer to eat than others? Well, well, luckily we don't, you know, the federal government, the FDA regulates that and then they, um, they pass that regulatory authority down to states and each state has a Department of Environmental Conservation or Protection that regulate shell fishing areas. And so they do water quality tests, they test the oysters. And so pretty much any oyster, if you're buying oysters from an oyster farm, they are having to be very thoroughly tested and regulated um, to ensure that that is safe water. And what I love about that, I mean, water is clean and safe for eating, is that all those oyster farmers are very powerful advocates for clean water in their area. You're right. Um, because whatever whatever happens on the land near an oyster farm is going to end up in their oysters. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, Good. you're really risking their livelihood by polluting that land. And so I love that that's a really powerful group of advocates for clean water. And it's a really highly regulated um, industry. I think it's also just important to to say that it takes about five years from the time that it settles out to get to an oyster that would probably appear on your plate. You know, it's not like a chicken that grows to plate size in seven months or so. It takes a while to make a, an oyster, especially in the colder water of... Although people are more and more wanting those small ones, that some of which are not even a year old. Those wow. are like the petites. I can't wait. They can't wait, but there are some that are younger than that. I'd say like a year, a year or two is becoming sort of the norm. Well, here's saying. another thing. It's carbon capture. It is. Exactly. It's carbon capture and sequestration. You've taken the carbon in the, or that's in the atmosphere and then goes to the water, then goes into the oyster and the, longer, the more you can keep them in the water or if you take them out to put the shell back in the water so that it <laughs> stays, so that the carbon isn't released back to the atmosphere. Out of the water, ultimately degrade and put CO2 back in the atmosphere. If you put it back in the water, it becomes a habitat and stays sequestered. Yeah, right. Yeah, that is another benefit. It's a, there's a lot. It's another benefit of, of the oyster growing. Yeah. Yep. Win-win. So Ira, Ira is opening up with a throwdown, and he says that uh, New York City water is better than San Francisco water. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also asking, is the Harbor School giving any uh, training in the management of aqua systems? I mean, um, assuming aquaculture systems. We are giving training to uh, 18 uh, sophomores, 18 juniors, and 18 seniors every year in our aquaculture career and technical education program. But outside of Harbor School, we're not. Billion Oyster Project does have different volunteer opportunities that um, may be able to count as some, but nothing official. So it's really just Harbor School is the public high school and Billion Oyster Project, we have the volunteer. There's not, although it'd be really cool, there's not really an in-between certification kind of program. Mm -hmm. but that, would be a, that would be really amazing. And our goal would be, our goal is that Governor's Island is the place where New Yorkers can go to learn and get trained to protect the marine environment globally. You That's just awesome. go on that fair, you're going over there, you're learning everything, you can get the skill, aquaculture, sailing, boat building, engine maintenance, marine biology, and then you- I wanna sign up. It's a working <laughs> waterfront. <laughs> I wanna know those things. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do with your life after your time at school, you have, you have some skills. Yeah. Right. That that complement the usual reading, writing, arithmetic. You've got something that- Well, it integrates them all. It does, you know? it pulls it all together. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really something to celebrate yeah. and support. And yeah. into that, Laura is asking, what is the application process like <laughs> to attend this high school? And how do you decide who gets to attend and who doesn't? That's a great question. And it's something that we're really proud of is that Harbor School is a not selective school at all. It's, a, it's called limited unscreened. And so of the 80,000 eighth graders in New York City, in the New York City public school system, they have a, a ranking system where they just rank their top 12 schools and they submit that piece of paper with a guidance counselor or a parent or a guardian signature. And then that goes to a central lottery system. 
Hmm. And when your name comes up, if Liz Taylor's name comes up a thousand out of 80,000, you're likely to get your first or second choice. But if Dr. Sylvia Earle's names come up 70,000, because that's just when it was chosen in the lottery system, yeah. you may get a lower choice. And so it's modeled after medical school. It's meant to make it, you know, in New York City, your geography in your neighborhood would determine what school you went to in most cases. And so um, that wasn't necessarily fair. So it's what Mayor Bloomberg did is he made the entire New York City public school open for high school. And so you can travel to any neighborhood to any different school, except for the Stuyvesant types, those are testing schools. But outside of that, it's a limited on-screen school. And what's hard about it is we get a lot of kids who are, uh, are you know, you get such a wide range of kids. Their expectations on the marine part, their ability to swim, their interest in being on a boat, their, their math skills. It would be easier for, uh, for Harbor School if it had some kind of a screen but we don't want that because then the screen will screen out the kids who wouldn't have otherwise yeah. learned about this and fallen in love with it. So it actually works out really well. And it's a really, it's got a really nice mixture of all different kinds of kids, but it's a regular public high school limited on screen. It's not a charter school, which a lot of people think it is. It's public high school. That's great. And Monica's asking us, did the Harbor School exist before the Billion Oyster Project? Yeah, we started the Harbor School in 2003 as part of Mayor Bloomberg's effort to create new small theme-based schools. Uh, we were in Bushwick, Brooklyn from 2003 till 2007. And I'm, yeah, and then we moved um, to go, I'm sorry, from 2003 till 2010. And then we moved to Governor's Island in 2010. And that's when we started creating the Billion Oyster Project. We need for you to move just a little bit to one side because your face has got a stripe down the middle. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't know that I was, the sun would set so fast where I am. How's that? <laughs> yeah, you're still you're a little bit half, half, half now. Half. Okay, I'll fix it when I, I got to see myself. Okay, maybe so. move to your right a little more. There, there you go. go. That's good. There. That's that's good. Probably hard that's, to see, but we can see. see you. We can see you better. <laughs> that's okay. So, um, Ira's come back and he's asking, how does current affect the recruitment Would less current result in more recruitment of oysters? And how does salinity affect survivability? Gosh, Ira, with your good questions. I know, right? <laughs> it's like, it's you, Ira, you've now gone into the just past my scientific knowledge. <laughs> we always reach that point. I just always hope it comes not, not before we're over. No. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, what we found is that um, the, the, some of the higher current places, there's still a lot of recruitment. Um, and I know that recently we had a lot of recruitment pretty far up the Hudson River um, because something about the salinity there, but then they died after a year. Mm. So, but you're right that, that, that water current and um, salinity are two of the biggest determinants for where our oysters are settling and where that we're finding recruitment. I just don't. I just don't remember what, you know, how they're all connected. If it gets too fresh, they die. Yeah. Right. That's it, what happened. I think there was a big spring rain and a lot of fresh water came down the Hudson River. Right. So you do get that kind of those pulses. And it's one of the reasons, again, why everything that you do um, upstream really makes a difference. Right. Because you do get a lot of these areas where you've got really heavy development, a lot of paving, and you get these big pulses of, of very fresh uh, water that comes out into a bay because you it know happened the, with Katrina. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so you need you need those those wetlands yeah. and you know things like bioswales and rainwater retention upstream so that you have kind of a more measured uh, flow when it mm -hmm. comes out into the bay and it can really help to protect the oysters. Yeah, you know, oysters tolerate a wide, relatively wide range of salinity and temperature, but there's a point. There's a tipping point. You get too far, too too fresh. Right, right. Well, I know that that's, that is a big issue for um, the lower Hudson. It's so heavily developed. And uh, right. the spring rains now affect the oyster um, survivability a lot more than they would have historically when the water would have seeped down into the ground. Yeah. So in that groundwater um, and that filtration that happens can also really benefit the oysters because it's capturing a lot of the the uh, pollutants that would otherwise just you know wash out into the bay and, and potentially kill the oysters. There's a horseshoe crab question here. 
Yeah, I see that. We're coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> I love horseshoe crabs. I, okay, so, yeah. all right. So we're going to see this question is from uh, Deb. And she said she was born in Oyster Bay, not very far from you. Probably not in the Bay. Not in the Bay. But the, the, <laughs> I'm just reading the question. <laughs> Um, but the question is, are you doing any work in the Long Island Sound, or is it just in New York Harbor? And how is the horseshoe crab, crab population now? The horseshoe crab population, I'm not sure about it. I just have anecdotal evidence. But I know that we, um, you know, one thing that we are, our, our work is really focused in New York Harbor. But Long Island Sound is ecologically kind of part of it, just like the Hudson River is and Raritan Bay is. Um, so it's not, so we consider ourselves to be, you know, kind of working there, but we're not actually working in those communities yet. We did do one program with a board member of ours up in Greenwich this year um, in Connecticut. Uh, we have not, and this is something I would love at some point, you know, Liz and Sylvia to get your advice on, we have not figured out what to do with something that's happening a lot, which is people saying, can you work with us? I mean, we have, if, if we just focused a little bit on the places around the world that want to replicate Billion Oyster Project, it would be a lot of work and a whole new strategy. And we just haven't, you know, I was sort of pushing in that direction. And Pete is a really good counter to me because Pete used to say, let's get a couple months of cash in the bank so that we can you know, <laughs> implement what we're doing in New York City. Yeah. Before we go look elsewhere. And it's a great point. But now we have had a couple more years under our belt. And we are, we have had success. And I think that there is a real yearning uh, for uh, a, a, a sort of low touch, not too expensive way to be able to implement programs or work with other partners outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, let's see, Kirk mm -hmm. is saying, uh, what are your thoughts on the best way to keep youth, particularly youth in underrepresented communities interested in marine science once They've left an innovative school like the Harbor School. Well, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You, you, I mean, I have some anecdotal. You, 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 I think you've got them hooked. You planted the seed, and at the right time, you know, the, it's a piece of them that will never go away. You've given them that. <laughs> that's something that. Most kids will never, in today's world, most New York kids don't have access to that, well, engagement with nature. Yeah. I don't know, what is, what's your response? Well, I think, I mean, it is something that we've struggled with a bit is that, and it's a great question, and it's been frustrating where you do get kids hooked, you do get kids excited, you know, you want you know, to in the marine environment, but then is that, but where are the jobs? How do I make a career out of this? Yeah. Right. That's, I think that has been frustrating for some of our students who get, um, they fall in love with the marine, but they fall in love with scuba diving or boats or aquaculture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not where all the jobs are necessarily. And so right. I think it's a, it's, it, it, you know, it's why we've been really excited when we can hire students at Billion Oyster Project who graduated and gone on and study those things. But I think it's also part of this idea of creating more of a blue economy and creating yeah. more careers related to the ocean that are sustainable, that are lower impact, that are thinking about carbon sequestration or, you know, whether it's the wind industry or aquaculture or tourism. There's, I think there's going to be more and more um, use of uh, the marine environment in a way that is less extractive and less destructive and less polluting, but still can offer good pain. Um, jobs and so that's sort of our bigger hope yeah. but on sort of shorter time scale it's frustrating because if you're in New York City and you leave Governor's Island you leave Harbor School it's still tough to access the harbor or it's still tough to find a, a career in those fields and that's something that we're really working on that you know yeah. and open up more of those careers and it is I mean we see that there you know there are some specialized institutes you know like there's some maritime institutes that are out there they're you know, commercial diving um, interests, are, you know, they, they are always looking for people that have that kind of integration and particularly some that have like some skills in sort of the environmental sector. You, you have also environmental companies, there's environmental law. Uh, so there's a lot of different things, but you have to be really creative because they're not just sort of like right out there. And sometimes you, you do have to kind of mash some things up in order to, um, to create a, a program that really works for you. But there are opportunities there and, and find your way and 
but but I think you're right, Liz, about the blue economy and, and you too, that one of your neighbors, Carl Safina, said we need to figure out how to use the ocean, but without don't use it up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we've we've been when we talk blue economy or how do you use the ocean in the past, it really has resulted in using it up. We've eaten right. all the oysters. Right. I think it's the cod that that once huh, were the cornerstone of the economy for 500 years and they're gone right and that's that's we can look back and say well, why did we do something like that but at least we can look forward and say let's not do that again yeah let's figure yeah. out just that and what you're doing is such a great model that the oysters are partners in this they don't know it but you know it's good for them but it's good for humans as well economically and right but let's keep working on i think it's a great thing to keep thinking about which is just as we can grow the number of blue economy careers and jobs and businesses that are you know not extracting and, and, and destroying um i think that that's a really exciting possibility because there's so much room and there's so yeah. much potential it's I a think. living blue economy yeah exactly <laughs> and and we are right at that that point i we, all of us, have witnessed this great era of, of learning things, discovering things that could not be known before recent decades, uh, from going high in the sky to go, going deep in the ocean or spreading the word in a global sense. But the, I think what we're right at the edge now is this great era of recovery. Mm -hmm. And we have to hurry because right. going back to nature, taking care of the systems that make our lives possible. That's really the challenge. And there ought to be a gazillion opportunities for making a living in that direction. Right, um, recovering and restoring. Yes. Right. And I think it, yeah. it, it is going to, it is where there are, you know, more and more jobs coming along. Mm -hmm. and, and it is at that point where some of it is just sort of finding our way. Mm -hmm. or Intellectually our challenging, but you might also need to know how to weld. That's right. right. <laughs> So um, I guess to that point, Evelyn is asking, what is the biggest setback, uh, or the, what is the biggest setback when you do this project? The biggest setback, I mean, I think the biggest challenge has been, and we're in a very good place now, but uh, the biggest challenge to restoring a billion oysters to New York Harbor, obviously anyone would say funding, right? If you have enough right. money, it's easier. I think one of the biggest challenges is that the, there's no state regulatory framework for really doing it. There's a really sophisticated state regulatory framework for protecting the ecosystem. Therefore, you have to get a permit to do anything in the harbor. Yeah. There's a very uh, sophisticated um, regulatory framework for growing oysters in waters that are classified as open to shellfishing. But in waters that are closed to shellfishing because they're too polluted, there's actually no regulatory framework for how do you restore an oyster to that place. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our permit process has been as laborious as if we are permitting a gigantic dock or factory in the harbor, even though it's an oyster reef, which has been proven to be beneficial, but there's no, there hasn't been yet. And now we've had a, we have a great relationship with the state DEC and we're all working towards it together because they also, they don't want to, you know, have to spend all their staff time on this either. We're creating a new regulatory framework where we'll be able to sort of get one big permit that for this entire area, it's great to store oysters as long as it meets this various goals. And then they and we can spend less, you know, we let time on thousands of pages of permits, which is what we have to do. Oh yeah, I'm well familiar with that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, incredible to, to put and, and also, what it's what it's done is the reason it has in some ways been a setback is because their job is to protect the existing ecosystem they're very hesitant to permit a 10 acre oyster reef and so you get a thousand acre oyster reef well anyone knows if you go to restore a forest and you put 10 trees out they have a much higher likelihood of dying right per, as an individual tree than if you put 10,000 trees out Mm -hmm. right. There's all kinds of beneficial community impacts that yeah. happen ecologically. Yeah. yeah. That you can't get from a little oyster reef. You get all the oyster drills. I mean, we went to our first little reef 
that was the first one that we got permitted and blackfish and blue crabs had come and eaten all our young oysters, all of them. <laughs> he said, thank right. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. When's your next tiny little group of oysters coming? Yeah, yeah. But if we put down 10 acres of oysters, they couldn't have done that. And so I think that that's been very hard um, and it's been one that we have through. I'm very proud of the fact that we've worked together with the state um, to where now they are actually pushing, Governor Cuomo is pushing us. I want 50 acres of oysters restored. Make great. it so. Exactly. <laughs> We're saying, well, a couple of years ago. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's been a great relationship. And now they've uh, really become our biggest partner where before yeah. it, it was our, a real challenge, the permits. Well, that's great. It's good to see that there can be positive change even to a, a you know really bureaucratic machine like that. Yeah, and it'll be a good model. It'll be a good yeah. model for other urban areas that have that are close to shellfish. Yeah, exactly. Because the mindset is about fish. I mean, whether it's fish or oysters, as commodities, as, as you know. But you're yeah. looking at it in a different way. Yeah, right, right. And yeah, so again, this is setting, showing how it can be done. Yeah, and then that really does provide encouragement to other places where we have similar problems. Right. So Maurice is asking us, are the drill snails the only natural predator in New York Harbor to the oysters? There are humans. Besides humans. <laughs> You're just mentioning the blue crab, yeah? Yeah, there are several species of crabs. Um, there's the Asian shore crab, which is an introduced species. There's the green, European green crab, which is introduced. There's a blue crab, there's mud crab. There's several species of crabs that will eat the young oysters. That can, if, there's, if the shells are thin enough, they can break their shells and eat them. There's the oyster drills. And then there are the blackfish, um, which is um, also, uh, what is it called? Um, not, I was about to say quag, but it's not quag. What is the other um, name for blackfish? It's escaping me. But yeah. anyway, they, they, we had an aquarium with a bunch of blackfish and we put in, we wanted to replicate an oyster reef. This is at uh, Harbor School on Governor's Island. And I'll never forget, we put in a bunch of inch long, maybe two inch long oysters, probably about a thousand to sort of build a little reef. And in three minutes, the blackfish had chewed up every one of them and out came this pulverized oyster sand. Wow. <laughs> and so they just turned it into like a white, <laughs> went from being a, a reef, they just ate them all crushed them all up, it came out their gills, and they were all gone. Wow. Now, you realize, if you think about coral reefs and parrotfish. Parrotfish, sure, they're making sand. You know. Exactly, and just thinking like, wow, what if we had gigantic reefs where the young oysters were grazed by blackfish um, in, in a similar way that parrotfish do it? And so that they're a real natural predator. Um, they need to be in sort of hiding spaces where the, the fish can't get to them. And, and obviously, when, once they get to about a year old, they don't have, they don't seem to have any other predators other than some birds that may be able to get them and break the, break them. Like and oyster catchers. Oyster, oyster catcher, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, oyster catchers. But again, for the oyster catcher, they have to be up close to the tide, the low tide mark. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It probably goes back to, to the point you're making earlier about how the young oysters naturally recruit to where bigger oysters are. Because it might give them some additional protection from, yeah, from the, and crannies. Exactly. Crannies, yeah, nooks and crannies. <laughs> so, um, okay, so Todd is asking a question. Um, what other industries could the shell be used in uh, outside of concrete? Do we know of any other? I guess people use the shell for like a nutritional supplement and for you know chicken supplements. Yeah, they are. They're, they're pretty valuable to the point where people are mining oyster shells. They're also valuable for restoration. I mean, we are, um, let's put it this way, they're valuable. They're, they're, they're valuable enough that people are mining them. People are, are, are increasingly recovering them from restaurants. And people in restoration projects like ours are paying for the shell, even wow. though it's still a waste product. Yeah. Um, and so... There's a lot of different uses. I think obviously the best use is to be put back into the coastal environment, wherever near wherever they were eaten or taken from. Um, because as I said earlier, that's still the limiting factor everywhere in the country is just enough shell for young oysters to attach to. So I would urge anyone uh, to use those oyster shells by building new oyster habitat and throwing them back in the water where you yeah. are. 
and and to your point that it's kind of cap leaving that carbon, carbon captured. captured and it keeps the carbon captured down in there yeah. Yeah. instead of it going up into the atmosphere or adding more <laughs> stephanie is asking um how far out do you find oysters or are they just along the shoreline how far out do we find oysters yeah well um i think historically in the harbor well let's put it this way we found a the the most oysters that we found that we weren't aware of was under the Haverstraw Bay when they were um, putting in, the, I mean, I'm sorry, in Haverstraw Bay under the Tappan Zee Bridge when they were replacing it and putting in what is now the Mario Cuomo Bridge. And at the foot of that, as they were doing surveys, they found some old oyster reefs that still had living oysters in them. And that, wow. was, that was 40, 50 feet deep. Okay. So that whole area used to just be filled with oyster reefs. So it was amazing to find that there are some that had survived that we had not been aware of. So they can grow really deep if the temperature and salinity and, and food and can food and food. Yeah. Right. So Kirk is asking, um, have you been able to involve any indigenous knowledge and the indigenous communities around the Billion Oyster Project? Oh, I love that question. I love that question. It's something, it's, it's a regret that I have that we have not really. Certainly knowledge. I mean, I, I, a lot of um, in the Big Oyster, you know, Mark Kalinansky did a lot of historical research, including a lot of indigenous knowledge to come up with an image of what was there historically. Right. And I actually spent some time researching all of the tribes as well as who was still around and representing different existing tribes. And I've never, I, I, I don't, know of and maybe we have on the staff level that I'm not aware of in the last two or three years but I don't think we really have pulled in um, and created relationships with and learned from and worked with indigenous tribes but I love that and that's a good reminder for me because I think that's just you know okay so a group of people several groups of people lived here for several thousand years without destroying it seems right. to make sense to learn some from what they know and that's, that's a real uh, great point. Thank you for that. Okay, we're going to take like three more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. So we're kind of running long, but it's such a great, <laughs> such a great conversation. <laughs> um, Larissa is asking: uh, Is there an opportunity or fit for most oyster fields along the U.S. coast, or would they be considered invasive in some areas? There is a native local species of oyster just about everywhere in the world and certainly all of North America. From Maine all the way down to Texas, it's, it's the um, Chrysostria virginica, which is the Eastern oyster that we use. Right. But on the West Coast, they're Pacific oyster and the Olympia oyster. Right. Olympia oyster. Well, the Pacific yeah. is the Japanese introduced oh, one. Oh, that's the introduced one. So it's just right. the Olympia oyster. Is that the only native oyster? Yep, the Olympia oyster. Right, so I mean, we could do it with just two species, which I love. Yeah, and it's, I think it's, it's really the way to go is to focus on, you know, again, restoring, not introducing anything, but restoring yeah, the, back, native, bring the back, native wildlife. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Hard to bring the big Pacific oyster, the Japanese oyster to Chesapeake Bay because there were so few of the natives. And some of us rose up and said, don't do that. You know, we've got enough problem with introduced species as it is. Yeah. Bring back, bring back, Chrysostria virginica. I mean, bring back the, you know, make them feel at home. <laughs> exactly. But that worked. And that, that, that's a success story. And that's, uh, yeah. you know, with all of the great advocacy, um, you know, from people like you and Chesapeake Bay Foundation deciding finally not to bring in the Pacific oyster. Now the Chesapeake is becoming a real, another real uh, recovery success story yeah. for the oyster. Yeah. Yep. Okay, two more questions. All right. Maurice is asking, does the school offer any summer programs or volunteer opportunities for high school students that don't go there already? Gosh, it's another place where I wish that we had created that. It's just uh, not really. You can get the best thing to do is volunteer with Billion Oyster Project. And a lot of that happens in Harbor School facilities, some of it with Harbor School teachers or students um, doing a lot of the same kinds of things. But Harbor School, you know, part of what I was trying to do is I was trying to make it be so many things. It's a public high school. And that's so hard as it is. Oh, yeah. Like, you've got 500 sets of parents. You've got the city. <laughs> uh, we, you know, yeah, all the 
there are so many hard rules. That's why Billion Oyster Project became really nice because as a nonprofit, it was much more flexible to deal with volunteers and to yeah. deal with outside programs and certifications. So anything like that really should be directed to Billion Oyster Project. Um, but you'll, if he does, if Maurice ends up volunteering, he'll see that it's all alongside and near and with Harbor School, but just we have to keep those things separate. Sure. Okay, this is our final question for you. <laughs> what is the number one way that you want New Yorkers to help the Billion Oyster Project? Well, I mean, that's a great question. Number one way, I'm gonna cheat and not answer it entirely. Our goal is a, our goal is a billion oysters and a million New Yorkers. A million New Yorkers restoring a billion oysters to New York Harbor. That's our goal. And that's, as I said before, I think, or maybe it was in our discussion before, is that if, 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 if a million New Yorkers get engaged, then they talk to 10 people a week. And that means everyone in New York will hear about this effort to restore a billion oysters to New York Harbor. And that we think is what we need to reach to actually help change society. So we want a million people engaged. And the ways to do that are become a member. You can go right to the BOP website and become a member. Um, volunteer, um, adopt an oyster restoration station right at the water's edge that you go down to and you count the, and monitor the oyster growth and the critters that live and associated with it, the water quality. We have a hundred of those. We could have thousands of those. It's just a little kit that you just drop over the edge of the water on 600 miles of waterfront. Um, get your local restaurant to become part of the Billion Oyster Project and collect shells. We're counting everyone that works in a restaurant as part of that million. Get your local school to become a Billion Oyster Project school. We have curriculum now for fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and high school. So all middle and high school, we have curriculum about New York Harbor and how we need to, you know, we need an ecological-based education. We, we've destroyed this planet because we don't know anything about it, you know? And so how are we continuing to, um, to teach and train and create young leaders who don't know anything about nature? And so... We really, have, we've created that curriculum for New York Harbor and we want every school to be implementing that. And we want every, you know, if you go to public school in New York City, we want you to have been, you know, swimming, growing oysters, engaged somehow in the harbor. And yeah. so those are the main ways right there. Those are the five main ways, the volunteer, the restaurants, the schools, the donor, the member, or the oyster restoration uh, uh, stations. And they could write a check. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We'll always take, as I said, that is definitely, that always is the hardest part. Yeah. It's always the hardest part. Um, and, and, and it's always so frustrating that the city can't look long term and think really hard about resilience and water quality and yeah, food and habitat and fisheries. And all of a sudden, wow, why doesn't the city put, but no, it's, it's never thinking about that way. So we rely on the private sector for a lot of our funding. So obviously any donation makes a big difference for us. And it is, our annual appeal is happening. So I'm sure you can look on the BOP website and find yeah. ways to help there. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, We're going to do this again. We will do this. We'll have some, yeah. we'll bring you back and have some updates and we'll talk more about the live blue economy and its importance. Because I think that's, it's really critical and getting all these things um, going in the same direction. To make it, it is. And really, and really for me, because I've been spending some time on this now, trying to understand what are the kinds of companies in the blue economy that we as real environmentalists think are okay, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I've gone down a bunch of different paths with different companies. And then I'm wondering, is this really just technology going to be used for drilling for more oil? And you know what I mean? And so it's always yeah. a little bit confusing for me to figure out what are those careers? What are those companies? Who do we want to get behind in the new blue economy? Yeah. Sustain, restore, recover instead of the deplete and detract and extract and yeah. destroy. But we, we, we try to go down that path every day. <laughs> it's, 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 and it's, it's tough. So It is. Yeah. It is. Well, looking forward to that conversation. And again, what an honor to speak with both of you. I had so much fun and it's just a, a great opportunity. Thank you so much, Gigi, for giving me the opportunity to do it. Yeah, Ocean Elders. I yes. failed to say at the beginning, I am one. <laughs> yes, you are. So again, thank you to our producers and our partners, Ocean Elders and Bedley Media. And mostly thank everyone out there in the community who keeps showing up and participating yeah. uh, week after week and month after month. Uh, dive in really feels like home to us at this point. 
I hope it feels the same to blue. you. And it's, it's blue. blue. <laughs> um, so we'll be coming back um, with our final show of 2020, which will be an Ask Me Anything. So get those questions ready for us. <laughs> We've been gathering them up. We've been gathering up a lot of questions over past episodes. Um, but thank you again. And before we go, we want everyone to remember. Yes, we need to take care of the ocean as if our lives depend on it. Because they, they do. do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Be well. We'll see you next time. Get wet. Get wet. Get wet. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.